Welcome back to the Dry Fasting Club. Today, we are talking about T3. We are continuing the main questions that everybody has uh, about T3. So I'm going to start it off with uh, 10 generic initial questions that I think everybody needs to have answered. We're going to talk about uh, why does a low body temperature require T3? Why does it synergize so well with dry fasting? Um, how low does the temperature have to go? How to take the temperature? Um, and the differences between taking T4, T3, NDT, which is natural desiccated thyroid, um, and then the differences between hypothyroidism and it's because some people are like, oh, I don't want to take the medication. You know, uh, what if I don't need to? And I understand that, but at the same time, move a, move aside, okay? Because people are serious here. People have serious chronic illnesses, and they've already tried everything, okay? They've even a lot of these people have even tried dry fasting, and it has not worked for them. There are so many people that have gone to fill and I've done a nine nine day dry fast comeback, and still had problems. Yeah, maybe they were really good for a few months because that's very common too. You know, the cortisol system, the adrenals are pumping. You feel powerful. You know, uh, if you know about this stuff, you'll know that you get similar results with a carnivore diet. And you also get that feeling, that superhuman feeling for much longer because the adrenals keep pumping while you're on that diet. But then there comes a point where things just break down. So I'm here for those people, you know, oh, I'm a purist. I don't want to put anything in my body. OK, great, great. Take the information that works for you and move aside for the people who are seriously looking to improve their health. And I've already gone from where you were or are sicker than you are. Okay, let's get started. This is going to be an important one. Strap yourselves in. All right, we're going to start it off with how can a low body temperature cause so many different symptoms? Why is this? Why does all of this matter? First off, our body is regulated in a pretty tight range of temperature. Once you move either too far to the left, too far to the right, now you're dealing with temperature that affects millions of enzymes, trillions of enzymes in your body. If it's too low, the enzymes are not going to work correctly. That's what you usually see. What do you see when it's too high? Well, you see fever. Why is fever so dangerous? Because you leave these optimal ranges, okay? It's very dangerous for the brain. What happens to the proteins is the most impactful thing during a fever and why you need to lower fevers that are way too high. Yeah, we're not getting into the debate of how much is actually good because there is a fever is a body's way of fighting, but if it gets too high, I think everybody here understands that it is a danger. And now what people don't understand is that when it goes low, it's just as bad. Yeah, maybe you're not burning through and death is not as imminent as a high one, but you definitely start to suffer. So low temperatures, no bueno. In fact, what happens when there is a low temperature? It indicates that there's less energy in the body system. When there's less energy, what does that mean? It means your immune system is not working correctly. You know, the enzymes are not working correctly. They're not, uh, your body absorption, retention of minerals, terrible. Vitamins, things really start to fall apart. And why you start to realize that keeping a temperature is probably the most important thing that you can do for your health. It trumps every single other marker. No blood test, nothing. Your temperature is the number one thing. Once your temperature falls out of range, everything falls apart. You know how in the health world, we're always looking for that base, base, correction. We're looking for the base problem. We know that doctors just cover symptoms. The society just treats symptoms, but they don't treat the underlying root cause. Well, temperature is probably one of the initial bricks in the foundation. If you imagine that bottom, that bottom layer of bricks, one of them or most of them are temperature. Okay. How is body temperature measured in this T3 therapy cycle? Uh, how are you going to do it? Why is it important? What you want to do is measure your oral temperature. Back in the day when this was actually popular, they used to use the mercury temperatures, uh, thermometers. They were 
probably some of the most accurate ones you could use. Nowadays, we don't really use mercury. You can probably still find one that uses gallium, just some other safer metals to do it. And they're also pretty accurate, but you can get away with just a good digital thermometer. If it's, uh, if it actually tracks temperature correctly, you know, sometimes if you really want to do it, you'll buy two and see which one you think is closer to the correction, but they'll be off by a little bit. But if you can find a good one, uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You want to track oral temperature. That's the closest. Uh, if you are testing inside your ear with like a tympanic one, you have to know that it measures a little bit higher. So you have to adjust to it. Oral is going to be your best one. And you want to measure something around 98.6 Fahrenheit, which is about 36.6 Celsius. That is an okay waking temperature when it should be a little bit lower. When you measure your temperature after eating, usually around 30 minutes afterwards, it needs to be around 37 Celsius, which is, I think, 98.6 correct me if I'm wrong. And that's actually very important. It means that your body is utilizing the food correctly. Uh, you'll actually notice that if your temperature drops after eating, that's a very bad sign. It means that your body is running on stress hormones on the adrenals and that when you feed it glucose and it gets to calm down for a little bit po after eating, your temperature drops. And that's a very big indicator that you are masking your issues with these, this aggressive adrenal system, you know, which is very common in late stage, low carb diets. So if that's you and you understand this, you know, you maybe you feel the best in the morning on a black coffee. That's that. Now I hope you're starting to understand. See, so follow the, the breadcrumbs. That is putting you into a cortisol state, which is faking you out with higher temperatures that are being fed by stress hormones. If you see that, that your temperature drops afterwards, big sign, you know, uh, start taking what I say very seriously and start digging into this very seriously. And you're going to uncover the truth and you are going to begin your journey towards real health, health where you thrive. Okay. It's quite a long journey, but you're already here. Um, now we're going to move on to question three, which is how low does my temperature have to be to indicate the thyroid uh, syndrome? Okay, just so you know, I'm reading this off of the uh, Dry Fasting Club forums, and I've put, there's a 50 question and answer thing, so check it out. Here's the link, and uh, just read through it. I, this is, uh, you know, probably printed out if you're taking this seriously. Uh, so how low does it actually have to be? It says temperatures consistently below 98.2 are a huge red flag. 98.2 Fahrenheit. Do you notice how close that is? 98.6 average is good. But when your temperatures are 98.2 and lower, you're already falling into dangerous zones. I've talked to extremely sick people that had abnormally low temperatures. And in fact, I was like, how are you still alive? How are you functioning like this? You're a walking zombie. What do you think a temperature of a zombie is if we, we somehow teleported into the walking dead and stuck a thermometer in a zombie's mouth? <laughs> They'd definitely be <laughs> cold as hell, okay? <laughs> so we've got a lot of walking zombies here with this hypothyroid epidemic that's sweeping the world. Off topic, hypothyroidism also linked to low sex hormones testosterone epidemic, hypothyroid epidemic, it all comes hand in hand, you know, on top of all of the estrogenic compounds that we are inundated with. Do I need all the classic hypothyroid symptoms to have this thyroid T3 problem? Uh, actually, no. So like I said, you could be masking it by self-medicating with stress hormone foods or activities or fasting, IFing. Uh, you could be self-medicating and, and sometimes the, what I really think about is the blood tests. I, we're not going to cover that in this section too much, but very often you're dealing with all of these issues, but your blood tests are coming back normal. And the doctor's like, I'm not going to help you. And if you're listening to this, you know, we can relate to, I know how messed up the medical system is. So you don't get all the classical symptoms if you are, um, self-medicating, you know, can it explain why I'm still symptomatic on thyroid meds like Synthroid. So in the previous episode, that's a good one. In the previous episode, I mentioned that there's like 23 million people on Synthroid right now, just in the US alone. So they pump you with T4. You know, the logic is they put T4 in you and your body's going to 
turn however much it needs into three, two, one. You know, pump it with four, then it goes three, then it goes two, then it goes one. The problem is chronically ill people usually have already a difficulty converting the number four to the number three. That, so we're clogging the system with the inactive one, which brings its own set of problems, you know. Uh, if that's you, then I want you to really consider this. T3 helps unclog the pipes. And then if we want to go into the weeds, we can talk about the importance of T2 as well. But that's kind of like min-maxing, kind of going too much into the details. Not always necessary. Uh, and you could argue never really necessary. So what I want you to understand is T4 in these situations, especially around fasting and chronic illnesses, is not going to be good. T3 by itself is the important one. T4, yeah, minuscule doses later on when you're weaning off, like these strategies uh, for optimizing the whole process. Yes, a little bit of T4 would be nice, uh, but I don't want you to think about it because you don't really need the T4 in this whole system. Okay, so the question is, if I have low, low temperature, am I hypothyroid? Not really, not by all definitions. Hypothyroidism in general means that your thyroid gland is damaged and is just not working the same way. If it's actually damaged and it cannot pump out the amount of T4 it needs and it's not converting and it's not creating T3 enough, then going on NDT or T4 like Synthroid is what you're going to have to do. But if you have low temperature but normal blood tests, that's exactly where the T3 therapy shines and what I see in chronic illness and fasting uh, people. So you have to see the nuance here. You have to understand that there's a glandular damage hypothyroidism and then there's hypothyroid-like symptoms when your thyroid system is not working correctly. And it's very hard to actually get that uh, monitored through blood tests. So there's Unless you know your doctor really closely is, and they're going to give you the time, you know, they run a business. They don't really have time to sit down with you and understand all of this. But if you do have that opportunity, then it makes sense to discuss it with them or drop them off a book, Hypothyroidism, The Unsuspecting Illness by Broda Barnes. Drop it on their desk, tell, ask them to read it. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Okay, the seventh question is, what test should I request from my doctor for suspected T3 problems? When doing this, you want to take a full thyroid panel that's TSH, free T4, free T3, reverse T3, complete blood test. If you can, check your cortisol and DHEA uh, and then check your heart. You know, it's important to know what state your heart is. So if you have that opportunity, a lot of people I talk to can't even get blood tests properly from their doctor. So you're going to be following symptoms, which is great because that's my preferred method of treatment. I prefer following oral temperature and just how the body feels on T3. That's can T3 therapy or this problem, this syndrome cause high cholesterol and does this treatment lower it? That's a great question because whenever it comes to hypothyroidism, even if blood tests are coming back fine, a very big indicator, if imagine we didn't even have the oral temperature indicator, if I see high cholesterol right away, ding, 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 I'm thinking, wow, your thyroidal system is not working correctly. Your body is not utilizing the energy enough. The energy is not high enough. Temperatures are not good enough to convert cholesterol into the hormones that you need. So your body is just producing cholesterol and it's getting stuck. Another thing that you can look at, high cholesterol, but lower sex hormones or high sex hormone binding globulin, all of these issues are uh, related to low energy and a messed up T3 system. So that is one of the big indicators. You've got low temperature, high cholesterol, boom. You are exactly the type of person that's gonna benefit the most from this therapy. Okay, question, last two questions. One, are symptoms like PMS or migraines linked to a messed up thyroid system? Yes, low temperatures disrupt hormone balance and enzyme function. So that'll worsen PMS, migraines, it, fluid retention is also a big one. Uh, and this helps a lot, you know, infertility, lots of other things. Can kids or teens have this symptom? This is a scary question because I hate experimenting with children. I do not like re even recommending never dry fast children. I, I just don't think that's the right thing. You know, there have been stories of people just becoming so desperate and going to Filanov's retreats or other dry fasting retreats and bringing their kids, you know, their 10 year old, 12 year old, 
And it becomes, it's such a difficult topic, you know, because if you've exhausted everything, it makes sense to keep trying. You know, these people have a lot of hope, but unfortunately I don't see a lot of big benefits doing this with children. And in fact, on a developing body, a developing brain, developing organs, I don't think it's safe and responsible to to get children to do this. You know, if you understood as much as I do at this point with fasting and how it affects the body, uh, you'd realize that it has negatives, especially on the developing body that you, I wouldn't put my kids through. I would much rather try a T3 therapy than fast my kids. If I've exhausted all options, blood tests are not indicating what I can actually do. Um, doctors are lost. I would do a T3 therapy. Yes. Um, so what does this actually say? It says, yes, symptoms like night sweats, low temps, fatigue, allergies in a six-year-old could indicate it. T3, not having enough T3 actually leads to a lot of developmental problems in kids. I would much rather my kid have slightly higher T3 than have it low during development. So that's something to look at. Uh, if you want to explore this deeper and you have kids and you really worry about them, I would uh, read a bunch of papers on T3 in children and children's development because they exist. There's lots of them out there. All right, that wraps it up for the first one. In the next one, we are going to talk about treatment basics. What is the protocol exactly? Like how much do you do? How do you start it? Is it safe if your tests are normal? Why T3 over T4 over T3? Uh, do I need to take T3 forever? That's a big one. Uh, what's sustained release T3? Where do I get it? Okay, I'm going to tackle all of that in the next one. Good luck on your dry fasting journey.